Hey, Coach, how are you? I am fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Well, I am more than thrilled to have you on my show and um, inspired by your story about just what you've done um, throughout your career, but what you've done for athletes. And the reason why I'm going to have you on my show today is to talk about coaching the heart of the athlete, which to me, when you think about a coach, a good coach, it's not about wins. It's not about championships or coach of the years. It's about literally coaching the heart of the athlete. And you do, you do that so well. And I can't wait to talk to you a little bit more about your mindset and how you do that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate All right. it. All right. Well, before we get into that, let's talk about something that I'm passionate about and that I know that you've taught many athletes for decades how to be mentally tough. So when you think about mental toughness, what does that mean to you? Oh, great question. Uh, mental toughness gets really personal when I think about it. And to me, mental toughness means that you know who you are, you know what your moral foundation is, and that you have the discipline mentally to make sure that your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions are staying true to your core values. Uh, because in the age, we all know, it's so easy to just hop on Twitter, hop on Insta and go and, and be uh, brainwashed by how, how you should think. And so I feel like mental toughness is really staying true to who you are and your moral compass. Absolutely. I love it that you say, you know, thoughts and emotions and actions. I think once you have those aligned, especially when you're in a high, you know, pressured environment and you can control all that, man, you're, you're in control, you're locked in. Well, you know what that is, if you ask any one of our athletes the last five, 10 years, what's the one thing you've learned from this vow? They're all going to pair it and they're going to say, life is about choice and the choices you make dictate the life you live. And every year, I just re regurgitated that so many times for our student athletes. And I would take them through up on, the, the, up on the, the grease board and draw a face, a smiley face, and draw their thought bubbles up there above their brain and just connect the dots for them. Yeah. That your brain, your, what you think determines your emotions, determines your actions. And the key in all this is you can choose what thoughts to feed and what thoughts to start. And it was so cool. I, I saw a trend about halfway through their sophomore year, they would have this aha moment that they could actually choose their thoughts. And on the contrary, every single year, I would have a freshman come up to me so seriously and say, Miss Val, you know this thing about, you know, you can choose your thoughts. I just can't help it when my mind goes to mean girl. And I would have a field day with that. I was just like, okay, here we go. <laughs> but it was really cool because once, once they embraced it, the, the wonderful part about taking the time to get mentally tough and choose your thoughts is once you do that, you are no longer a victim in life because you're choosing your actions. Totally. Absolutely our thoughts influence our behaviors. And, and I love that. And I can only imagine the, all the years you've coached when you, when you get a freshman and you get them so green and then you see that progression by, the, by their senior year and you've seen this growth. Oh, it's amazing. It is just, and as I said, it really, the trend is halfway through their sophomore year. So they've spent about 16 months there ruminating on all this and then they have their aha moment. Another one of my... <laughs> Another one of, I think she was like a, a junior maybe when she had her aha moment with all this. And I was so proud listening to her just talk about how liberating it was to be able to choose your thoughts and, and basically to choose your life that you want to live. And she looks at me and she goes, not bad for somebody that doesn't have a fully developed frontal lobe. Because I kept, that was another thing that I was telling them is that, you know, we don't develop our, our frontal lobes till we're 25, 26 years old. And right. that's reasoning that's what helps you not make stupid do, do stupid things in life so you know put space between your stimulus and your response even though you don't have a fully front developed frontal lobe now and she was all proud of herself that she came to this conclusion not having a fully developed frontal lobe <laughs> <laughs> 
I love it. Well, when, <laughs> when you think about, and I know this is kind of, this will probably be a tough question because you have so many years of, of great athletes and great memories and experiences. But when you reflect on your whole career, can you share a specific time, whether yourself had to be mentally tough or there was an athlete that you coached that in the moment did the right thing to be mentally tough? Uh, the thing that comes to mind, honestly, when you ask me that question is um, when I was diagnosed with cancer, which was almost six years ago. And in the midst of my mental chaos and fear, I heard, be anxious for nothing and grateful for all things. Wow. And whether whomever is listening to this, if you translate this as like the universe speaking to me or cosmic energy, I translate that as God speaking to me. And I got kind of snarky with God and, and I was like, okay, this be anxious for nothing thing isn't really sitting well because I just got diagnosed with a potentially fatal disease. And um, it, I went to the doctor the next day and she told me with a big smile on her face, I went to my oncologist, she said, had you been diagnosed 10 years ago, we had absolutely nothing for you. But if you choose to get chemotherapy for a year and surgery, we know it's going to work. And it was like my whole world just stopped. Wow. And I understood the commandment that I was given, be anxious for nothing and grateful for all things. I got to get chemotherapy because I lived at a time that had it. I mean, I was so grateful that I got to get chemo. I actually called it going to my chemo spa. And I shared this with our student athletes, how just switching that one word, have to, to get to, oh, change man. the perspective of life. It's, you know what? It's so powerful. I talk about that all the time. When you get to, I don't care what the situation is, if it's, if it's life-threatening, if it's pressurized, stressed out, but you get to. I mean, that's, that's part of my man, mantra when I speak in front of large teams or large you know, audiences. I always say, I get to do this. They want to hear me and tap into your joy. But when you say I get to, boom, right? That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Tap into your joy. Okay. Um, I'm kind of hijacking this interview right now. But Oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, I was very, very fortunate. Last year, I had a one-on-one -on -one for about an hour with Kobe Bryant. And the majority of the discussion was about joy and how in anything you do in life, anything, studying for the SAT, going to the doctor's office, whatever it is, emptying the dishwasher, when you infuse joy in the process, it makes the results so much greater and grander. Oh, and he talked, about, um, he talked about the joy, the different, what we talked about the difference between fun and joy. And fun to me is kind of like external. Fun is stuff that happens, that's fun. Joy is a deep rooted sense of pride that comes from knowing you've done a great job at something. And, and Kobe said, yeah, me getting up at 4.30 every morning and going into the gym and getting in two extra workouts before the team ever showed up, that filled me with such joy. Hmm. It was fun, but it was joyful. Wow. You know, it's, it's, it's really interesting you bring up Kobe because it was really, it was a special moment, but it was also a little bit eerie that I was reading his book, Mamba Mentality, and I finished it the day before he passed. And so, and I've been, I've been picking it up, putting it down, picking it up, putting it down. I picked it up and I finished it. And it, it's to me, because it's so about the mental side of, of his game, which I connect with, it was so intimate. Like, I felt like he was having a conversation with me through his book and then, and then he leaves. I'm like, what the, and it was, yeah. um, but it was, I felt like I, there was a piece of me that really got yeah. to experience him because I, I took the time to read, but it was just the timing of it. And, yeah. and what's really interesting about joy. Um, I, I'm so blessed to work with uh, a, one of the, probably the best basketball women's varsity um, high school basketball coach in the country. Her name is Sue Phillips. She's, she's cut from the same cloth as you. And her success is, is out of this world. But her whole, even though that she's really, really, really like intense and she demands a standard, but she is all about joy. So what she does every practice, she makes all the girls get in the key for 10 minutes before practice and just tap into their joy 
and be goofballs and get, get it going, get the juice going before they get into a very intense practice. But she, the basis of her program is based off joy. I love that. I love it. And so many people misinterpret that as fun. Like right. so many people have like the haters out there that want to find something, you know, and hate about me. They'll say that the only reason I was successful is because I had so much talent. And because when you look at, when you pull up any one of our meets online, you're normally going to see me dancing and smiling and hugging and kissing the athletes and the whole bit. Yeah. And that release of joy came from, like I always felt our, our competitions were a celebration of all of our hard work. And so you, you get in the gym and in order to be able to have that type of relationship with my student athletes in the heat of competition, you have to be authentic. And I had to have that same relationship with them during the week, right? I mean, I couldn't just be coming and be a hard ass and, and not care about them as human beings and then go into a meet and expect them to trust me that I really did care about them more than just their gymnastics. Right. But, um, oh, I totally agree with, with what you were saying about that coach. It's anytime you infuse joy in the process, it makes the results so much better. I mean, so much better. It's my favorite, it's my favorite emotion. Uh, you know, it's, it's, and it's, and it's also my, um, it's my armor. It's my tool. It's my ammunition. Like when I want to shift my mindset, man, it's, uh, I just, I've taught myself how to switch it on. Yeah. And so have you found that it has been difficult these last few months to live joyfully during so much pain and suffering? Yeah. You know, at first, because, you know, I'm a, with my business, my, my business slowed down a lot because it's based off athletics. So I've had to kind of the first month or so I had to recalibrate. Okay. What would it look like if I had to start all over again? And then I'm like, but how awesome is that? Because I've seen how many times have I started over in my life a lot and I'm, and I'm prepared for it. And now I have all the tools. And if I get to reignite and, and redo this whole thing, it's going to be even better. So there's, and you know, and there's, so there's joy in that creation. And what's really crazy too, is that I, I was a musician when I left the game of football, I became a musician for years. And then as I got into my new profession, the last six years or so, I've kind of abandoned my music and this, all this time now has allowed me to, to tap into my creativity. And I'm like, I'm, I'm playing everything, bass, guitar, piano, I'm singing. I'm like, so it's, um, at first it was hard to tap into the joy, but it gave me clarity and I allowed myself to reframe it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah. Wonderful. What are you? Uh, it's been hard actually. It's, and I didn't, you know, I just, I can't sleep at night. I'm, I'm worried about everyone out there. Um, I would go walking with a girlfriend through this whole thing and, and like for weeks I could, I was obsessed over what was happening in India and how many people were dying in India and dying of starvation and all that. And then my, I shifted to Yemen and then it's like, my husband's like, you don't have to go out even out of the state to really worry about people. We got plenty of people here for you to worry about. Right. Um, but I had a, a really interesting heart to heart discussion with our support psychologist and um, about how are we, why is it even okay to try to live joyfully when so many people are suffering? And I remember watching the news one night and, and watching a nurse that, you know, had the scars from the masks and everything. And she said, I am doing this so that you guys can live a healthy life. So please, the way to honor me is to social distance and wear your mask, but to also be grateful and joyful for the days that you have. Yeah. And it was like, I got it. You know, it, it, and this is how I've always felt about our military, that the way I'm going to honor the people that have fought for my freedom in this country is by living fully and joyfully and appreciatively and gratefully. Totally. You know, and I think there's, there's all different kinds of uh, forms of joy. I mean, obviously the joy that you and I are talking about, you know, that there's this, it's, it's, there's a lot of frequency to it. It's powerful. It's colorful. It's, it's positive. But I also think that from us, when you're in service, whether if that service is a thing that's heavy, like being a nurse or 
you're dealing with uh, the homeless. But there's, even though that's heavy, but there's joy to it. And I think uh, when you can still tap into that, even though there's heaviness to it, I think that um, joy can still live and still be, you know, that powerful thing. Absolutely. And it's like, you know, you look at something that is not heavy, it's not going to bring you joy. It's going to bring you fun. It's called <laughs> recess, you know? Right. right. <laughs> well, go out and play recess. Right. I just feel like the human body is constructed, the mind and the heart are constructed where we love a challenge because that is where we find the joy. You don't find joy in things that aren't challenging. It's just totally. fun. Right, right. Exactly. Well, and when you think about, you just talked about the heart and this is one thing I want to talk about, um, about coaching the heart of the athlete, because there was something, and I was telling you earlier before we got on, on the show that I'm very kinesthetic. So I'm a feeler. And the first time that I saw you in action on TV, here I am, I'm looking through a TV and I'm seeing you. And the way that I, I saw you dancing and smiling, I could feel your energy through the TV. But as soon as I saw you hug, one of your athletes, I was like, now that's, a, it just came out like, that's a great coach. And then the more that I started to find out what you've done for, you know, for years and years with, with UCLA, it made me realize how special you are because I've worked with, especially in the game of football, which, you know, cause you're married to a, a football coach. Um, and there's a beautiful coach that I worked for that he would say this in front of all of his parents every year when they came in for a parents meeting, he goes, if you're not okay with me hugging and kissing your son, then I don't want him on, on, on the team. And if he quits, which he won't, but if he does, then I'm going to go to your front door. I'm going to tell it's your fault because no one quits on my team. So, and I saw him every year kissing and hugging and telling the kids how much he loved them. And you don't get a lot of that in the sport of football. No, I don't think you get a lot of that in a lot of sports. Um, and this is, this is the reason why I've chosen to retire. I retired last June um, to spread this message. And I, I did a TED talk call. It was all about is, is all winning success? And no, it's not. And right. how we have to redefine success for those people under our care. Um, and so in sport, in coaching, it was just so obvious to me that if you don't care about the heart of your athletes, if you don't care about helping coach them, teaching them, mentoring them to develop into superheroes through sport, if that is not your focus as a coach, then you only care about winning. Mm. And then your athletes become commodities, pawns on your chessboard for you to win. And I just feel like, I feel like the quintessential coach is someone who is a great strategist that loves the game and loves the chess pieces of the game, but that also is an altruist that really comes from a holistic, fully in, embracing the athlete as a human being and not just focus on, focusing on their athleticism. You know, when I, we were talking about this earlier as well, but when I was watching a piece from the Players' Tribune and I saw, I don't know, there was 10, 10 athletes that you coached in the past that were sharing how special you were. And you, you can just tell, like some of them were emotional. Some of them were just really happy and joyful just to talk about their experience with you. But man, you could feel through their testimonies that you touched their heart, you touched their life. And I was just like, as I was like, I was getting a little choked up because obviously they had music behind it too. But I'm like, man, how, how awesome is that to, 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 to do that for these, these athletes? So when you are actually coaching the heart of these athletes, what is the philosophy? Like, what, is, what do you focus on? Um, what is your blueprint to get inside these athletes? Uh, first of all, you have to develop trust. And you have, to, you have to be very consistent with how you speak with them, how you treat them, how you listen to them. You need to truly listen to them when they're speaking. Um, you gotta develop the trust. And then the only reason someone needs a coach in life is to do, help them do something that they can't do on their own. Otherwise you wouldn't need a coach. Right. So part of my job was to take this 18 year old 
and coming straight into college and and every day seeing the potential in her that she couldn't see on her own and then and then getting her excited and inspired and motivated to want to reach a new plateau to, to a new level of greatness um, that she would have never thought that she could and, and quite often it was academically it was you know I'm just not smart enough or something like that I'm like yeah you are you just got to figure it out yes you are yep um, but I what I loved and what I miss the most uh, um, since I quit coaching is I loved celebrating each of our student athletes as unique individuals. And I would always tell them, you know, in the history of this world, there's never been another you. And when you die, there's never going to be another you. Mm. So you're born for a reason and tap into that inner light, fuel it. And then most importantly, share it with the world. Um, and I got the greatest compliment of my career a few years before I retired. It was from Bart Connor, who was um, commentating that year at the national championships. And he said, Miss Val, you've got the most diverse team. And I looked at our team and I thought he was talking about their ethnicity. And I said, yeah, we are pretty diverse, aren't we? And he says, I'm not talking about how they look. He says, I'm talking about the fact that you celebrate them as individuals more than any other coach I've ever known. And he said, you have proven that when you celebrate diversity, it is actually uniting and not divisive. And I was like, that is the best compliment I could ever receive as a coach. Wow. That's awesome. And when I think when you do that and you allow them to be themselves, but you create this space. And when you have emotional space, as an individual, there's so much freedom. You can move the way you want in situations and also when you're competing. And when you have somebody like you or the coach that's fostering that environment, and I've seen that in other environments, like it's, it's beautiful. And you talk about that tapping into that energy. Now that's one thing I wanna talk about as well because when I've been doing this, when I've been doing this mental skills training for the last six years or so, I've been talking about the basis of this work is breath. And it is from a mindfulness standpoint, breath, breath, breath. But what fuels the breath is energy. So I've shifted the last couple of years of really, really getting into the, the, the weeds of teaching energy. And you have this like, this energy that I, I can see it, I can feel it, I can hear it. It's, it's awesome. But when you have so much energy and you can tell how connected you are to the player or to your teammates and to the to sport, how do you take care of your energy? Um, I just, you know, energy and I'm, you know, you and I are speaking the same language right now. It's what you give out, you will receive. And so if I'm down in the dumps, the first thing that I'm going to do is go do something for someone else because that will fuel me. That will fuel my energy. And, uh, it really all comes down to love. It comes down to loving human beings. It comes down to loving what athletics can do for human beings. The, it's, I, I've always felt it's a, sport is a masterclass in life lessons that yep. you don't learn in the classroom. Um, and I'm assuming a lot of your listeners out there are in the sports field and, and such. And so I'm going to name drop again. Uh, I was super, super close with Coach Wooden. And in his pyramid of success, which has been used all over the globe by not just sports people, but businesses and the military and such. He always was down on himself that he didn't put love as one of the bricks of the pyramid. Mm. And I would argue with him. I was like, no, 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 coach, you're wrong. <laughs> I think this may be the only time in your life you're wrong. But <laughs> coach, then, you're wrong because if you would have singled out love as one of the bricks, they would have diluted all the other bricks because in order to have the, in, in order to live each of the bricks of his pyramid of success fully, it has to be infused with love. Each brick has to be infused with love. Right. So the cornerstones of the pyramid are industriousness and enthusiasm, working hard. You're not going to have a full brick of, in, of working hard if you don't infuse it with love. Just like we were talking about joy, the same thing, right? Totally. Yep. And and I just feel that I love 
loved uh, my student athletes, even the ones that were pain in the neck, even the ones that didn't love me. Well, it's funny you bring up that that pyramid because I'm very familiar with it. But you're right; it's it the infusing of it is kind of like the cement around each block. Right. right? It's so yeah. Thank you, coach. Are you listening to this? Okay, I'm right. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love it. Well, let me, I want to talk about um, vulnerability just because, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, it was a, it was a negative word. It was a bad thing. It was a weak word. And now as Brene Brown has done a lot of research and now it's, it's a beautiful word and man, tapping into your vulnerability and trusting yourself is, is awesome. And I've, in some of your interviews that I've, I've listened to, you've talked about you wearing a lot of hats. So there's the coach, there's the mother, there's the friend, there's the therapist. You're wearing all these different hats. How did like, how did you find the balance of knowing the line of vulnerability within wearing those hats? And then was there a, a time where an athlete kind of took advantage of, of you wearing all these different hats? Um, I don't think that they took it any time that they took advantage of me because if they did, it was because I allowed it or I wasn't strong enough to hold my peace. I don't know. But, um, uh, yes, I love Brené Brown. I just got through teaching my very first course. I'm a professor now. I'm professor, Miss Val, oh. uh, at the, uh, at UCLA in the school of education. And it was a uh, philosophy of coaching and leadership. And we studied all we studied 10 different coaches phil jackson bobby knight john wooden uh, pat summit myself all these coaches but the underlying thread of the book was underlying book that we used the entire course was Brene brown's dare to lead mm -hmm. and there these graduate students uh four of them were football graduate assistants the other ones uh all wanted to go into coaching and they said exactly what you just said at the beginning of this they said I never thought of vulnerability as a strong word. I always thought of it as a weakness. Yeah. But you can see now, vulnerability is the first step to courage. And I had one young man in the class who's extremely bright. But he comes across kind of like as a know-it-all. And he said, when I, was, when I was reading about vulnerability, I'm realizing that I've never allowed myself to be vulnerable. He said, cause I'm a, I'm a son of a coach. So when you're the son of a coach, you have to grow up and be invincible and, and vulnerability is a weak word. And he said, I'm realizing now that it's not only held me back from my sport. He says, it's not being, allowing myself to be vulnerable and show vulnerability has prevented me from having really deep friendships. And I was like, I love the fact that he had that aha moment in a course about sports wow that's that's powerful you know and i also think too with the word being vulnerable or vulnerability i th getting athletes to think about being vulnerable with their play it's one thing to be vulnerable with your feelings and sharing your thoughts and cracking up in your chest like hey coach this is what i'm feeling right now and i hope you don't look bad at me for for being vulnerable but then it's it's the basketball player or any other you know, uh, athlete, but a basketball player that's missed eight shots in a row, you know, and, and you have the game winning shot. Are you, are you going to be vulnerable in the moment and trust yourself and trust all that hard work you've done in the, in the dark or are you not? And you're going to dish off the ball and then wake up the next morning questioning like, man, should I've taken that shot? But even if you take the shot and you missed it, man, there's success in that. Like you stood in that moment and vulnerable and you were brave and you're courageous. That is awesome. Right. Yeah. I've also noticed that with, with the greats of any sport, um, they, don't, they don't assign a judgment on themselves personally when they make a mistake. They don't judge themselves. Mm. They at a strategic place of what did I do wrong and what should I do better the next time I get up to, to shoot a free throw, you know? Right. Um, they don't go, oh my God, I suck. I'm horrible. I'm I, you know, I, I'm, I suck at basketball. They don't, they don't say that. And I've noticed that with our gymnasts, the ones that the Olympians that have come in and all that, they can fall off the beam and go, ugh, they can get pissed, but they are, they don't judge themselves for right. it. And that's, and the ones that do, 
the majority of them do. With the majority of the athletes that I, you're, it's such a waste of time and energy. <laughs> it is. Because you're, and then once you once you get over your pity party, you're still <laughs> going to start and analyze what went wrong, what didn't go wrong, and then get back up on the beam and do it again. So let's just let's just leave out the beginning of that, the pity party and the judgment part, and just let's just go to the learning part. Yep, feedback. Uh, someone told me the coolest name for negative self-talk is the when you fail or you have a mistake it's the itty bitty shitty committee and <laughs> when you when you plug into that man you give it so much power and, and you you've lost you've lost your power and you've, you're in the effect of this mistake that's in the past and you can't do anything about it so you're emotionally paralyzed and it's hard right. to actually be great when you're emotionally paralyzed right especially if you're in a team sport yeah I'm Imagine a quarterback, you know, he, throw, he throws an interception and he's having his little itty bitty shitty pity party. Okay. What's that doing for the next play? <laughs> right. Right. And there's a, there's a funny story. It's actually a beautiful story. A, a, a professional baseball player that when back in the day when the Cardinals were winning all the World Series, he was on one of the teams. His name's Aaron Miles. He would say, every time that I get in the batter's box and I strike out, whether if I'm looking or I swing, if I swing, if I smile when I strike out, that means I've gotten the lesson. I've gotten better, even when I've actually struck out. But the thing was, is that when I did that, everybody on my team was like, "Why are you smiling? Like you just struck out." And so he, he, he no one understood his thought process. But when he actually would get pissed and get mad, then he wasn't getting the lesson. So it was, it was about smiling to trigger that that opportunity to, to get the lesson from it. That's brilliant. And that's that whole philosophy of what you just said is the reason why I do not believe in the word failure. Right. Failure, because if you've learned something in the process, it's growth. Growth and failure cannot coexist. So yep. get rid of it. Get rid of it. I, I actually listened to Michael Gervais about, um, he was talking about that and it totally made sense. It shifted my paradigm of, he's like, failure done a mistake. Failure is not trying. That's failure. And I was like, oh, okay, that, yeah. that, makes, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it is. It totally is. Yeah. So when we talk about connection, um, so right now we're talking about the pandemic, and I talk a lot about with my athletes right now, that I feel like we're disconnected, even though there's some things going on um, that are unifying our, our, our society. But the pandemic has put things on pause and has put us in fear mode. And so I've been sharing my thoughts of like the word of connect or connection. Like we need to focus on connection, plugging into people that feed us and also feeding ourselves, connecting to our craft. I don't care if you're a workplace professional, you're a coach, you're an athlete, whatever, you're a musician, but focus on connecting with your craft. And so we can come out of this, so you can come out ahead of this, but we need to stay connected. And you from, from afar, man, you are all about connection. and. So, and I know that you stay very close to your teammates, but do you, what do you do to still stay, stay connected to all your athletes? And what do you miss the most of not being connected with them? Uh, what I miss the most are the daily little life connections with them that either I'm learning from them or they're learning from me or <clears throat> um, little things like the importance of saying thank you to someone looking in the eye and saying thank you yeah and then respond like our all of our athletes know that you just don't walk by somebody and go thanks you stop you look at <laughs> me and say thank you and there's that moment of connectivity which even gets better when they look you back and they say you're welcome and little tiny things like that would ignite all day long in the gym and I loved it when I would see them going up to each other and not just blowing a walk. Oh, thanks. But really going up and saying, thank you, or giving them a hug or something like that. So there is that connectivity. Yeah. It, it, this pandemic has shown all of us that we are social beings. Yep. And that we need to connect. Yes. And uh, I have been, you know, we started this conversation about mental toughness. And um, from the very first week, I realized that I was taking out my frustration and my sadness and my fear in my husband. And I was like, that is not okay. And so I literally just started the next day 
purposefully, intentionally saying, being kind. And, and as the simplest way to be kind is simply to say thank you. And our relationship has grown closer and closer and closer in these last few months than it's ever been for 22 years, closer than we've ever been. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, again, there's the opportunity, right? Here's a crisis that we're in. The opportunity is to foster a better relationship or whatever that, that opportunity is. And that's, that's what I've been keen on. It took me about the first month when I was, I, we were talking earlier about how I was kind of going through some stuff going, okay, what's happening right now? And, and, and I'll be vulnerable in my show. I remember what came up for me when I sh- was sharing my thoughts and my emotions with my wife. I was like, I feel like right now I'm in last place. And she's mm-hmm. like, whoa. She's like, but you were just like a month ago, you were in first place. Like, and so I talk about the emotional roller coaster, how to actually manage that roller coaster. And here I am, I'm riding it. So she, she gave me some clarity and, you know, kicked me in the butt a little bit. But I, I had to realize, like, you know, if I want to be in last place, then I'll be in last place. But if I want to be in first place, like, like you're saying, make that choice. So right. I just make different choices with my thoughts. Right. That's great. It's wonderful that she was there for you. You know, it's not love and tough love. It's all the same thing. It's just love. Yeah. Like people always say, what's tough love? It's just love. It's all this. It's just love. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Well, a couple quick questions here before we close up. Um, Going back to how you got into gymnastics. I know what, what I think is beautiful when there are coaches that have your success had didn't play the sport. There's a, there's a coach that I work with for a volleyball team. Um, one of the best in the country in high school, same thing. He never played the sport, but he's just, he, he, he plays chess in his mind and he knows how to build relationships. Um, so you got into the sport with music and which resonates with me because music is, I think is so it's interchangeable with, with sports, um, in so many ways, but, what was it that music got you into sport and I, how important is it to like, do you think that the music is important to creating rhythm with, within your sport? Well, um, I wish I could be as deep as you are with the whole music <laughs> here, but the truth is I was 16 years old. I wanted a summer job. I called up a local gym. I asked them if they needed a dance coach and they said they didn't have any money for it, but they needed a pianist because back before 1980, floor exercise music was only one instrument and it was usually the piano. And we also had compulsories. So, and compulsories were often played live on the piano. So that's how I got into gymnastics because I just wanted a summer job. <laughs> but to take, to translate what you're saying about music and to translate it, how that resonates with me is I have always felt the choreography is any intentional movement. So choreography isn't just dancing to to music. How you stand up, how you sit down, how you nod your head, how you say hello or goodbye to someone, how you wave, is all choreography. It's personal. And um, I actually wanted to call my book Choreograph Your Life because I just feel like take charge of your life and, and feel that inner rhythm, feel that hum, within you that really resonates with you and choreograph every thought, every emotion, every action, take charge of your life. And so that rhythm, as you're speaking of, I'm, I'm translating it to my vernacular and that's choreography. You know, it's, this is, this is actually really beautiful. Um, the coach that I was talking about, the volleyball coach, who had never played volleyball before. Um, he's, he's an incredible individual. But when I had him um, on my show not too long ago, I always ask this question to every coach when we talk about culture, and I'm, it's going to be my next question to you, okay. is um, if you were to deem uh, your culture, like put a name to it, like the effort culture or do your best every day culture, whatever that is, what, what would that be? And I, when I asked him that, he said, Never thought about it before, but I would say chorus line culture. He goes, everything we do, it's every, it's like everyone has to be in sync, and they do. Like everything they do from start of practice to end, before a game to the end of the game, they all do certain things that they've practiced and rehearsed. And he goes, so it's like a chorus line. 
So they've just choreographed it every single day. It's part of their culture. Right. So with that being said, what would you, what would you name your culture at UCLA? Oh, um, what a wonderful world. Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of, you know, whatever song out there or whatever Broadway hit show celebrates diverse, uh, West Side Story, diversity. Um, um, coming in and, and I, I was very, very vocal with them, with the student athletes constantly about not comparing themselves to anybody else. Because when you do, first of all, you're never going to be as good at them being them as they are. And second of all, it prevents you from becoming the best that you can be. And so in our gym, it, it, on a daily basis, if we started working at 745, if you came to the gym, you would think that it was totally chaotic, but it was organized chaos. Mm. The music is blaring and we have assignments, but it's not rigid like that because I had athletes that have been to two Olympian, Olympic Games and I had athletes that were on a far lo much lower level that had to put in the work. They didn't have the quote unquote 10,000 hours behind it, you know? Um, so yes, you got coached differently. You had different assignments during the day. And so people were, they come in and watch our workouts and they were shocked that we got so much done in this environment of supposed chaos, but it wasn't. It was everything that we did in there was purposeful in, in fueling their joy and their yeah. inspiration and their, them being inspired to get better, 1% better. That's all we're doing today, get 1% better. Let's figure out what that 1% is. Let's talk about it, let's put it out there, and now let's go work to get 1% better. And that was the goal every day. So I'm, I'm not really answering your question about the culture because I can't find the right words, but I'm just seeing this, this world like this of seeming chaos, but it's really not. <laughs> Probably there's a lot of energy in that culture, right? A lot of energy and a lot of, of ownership and trust. Because mm. we're going to have the music blur blaring and you're going to be off on the side dancing. I expect you not only to get the assignment done, your assignment, but I expect you to have the maturity to know when to stop dancing, to get yourself focused, to go up on the beam and perform well. Right. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Well, one more question. I know it's deep and I'm, as you can tell, I'm, I'm kind of a deep person, but um, this one I love because it's all about reflection. And I think this is how we grow when we look at, um, our experiences. So when you look at your whole career, when you think uh, about reflecting on it, what do you think you've learned the most about yourself? Ooh, uh, that as, as much as I learn and as hard as I, as I work to be my best self and to be the best coach and teacher and mentor that I can be, I'm going to screw up a lot. And as long as my intentions were pure and they didn't come from a place of ego, I needed to give myself a break. I needed to not beat myself up. Don't have that itty bitty shitty pity, pity party. <laughs> yeah. Because we're going to, you know, as long as you're living, you're going to screw up. And as we talked about, I mean, I believe all of the quote unquote soft skills are actually life skills and strong skills. So to be able to be vulnerable, humble, to be able to apologize sincerely, I felt, even though I hated screwing up, we all do, I felt it was such a gift to be able to model those behaviors for young women and how your relationships actually get closer when you do humble yourself, when you do sincerely apologize. And teaching them, apology isn't about what the person to say back to you. The apology is about you lifting the burden from your heart. Yes. And um, I learned from the years and years and years of coaching to get over myself, to get the ego. There's no place in, co in ego, in, in coaching for your ego. There's not. Right. You can have pride, pride in a job well done, but not ego. And that if, as long as I was consistent 
with the love and the care that I showed our student athletes, that it would see me through all of those blunders that I knew I would have. Totally. There's something about um, apologies and also forgiving. When you either forgive yourself or forgive someone else or you apologize, you, you're, you're free from it. If you're genuine, you're authentic behind it. It's just, it's freeing, man. You it feel is. so much lighter. Yeah, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I could, you know, coach, I could, man, I can keep on talking to you for hours. Um, and I really, really enjoyed uh, just understanding how you coach the heart of an athlete and, and understanding uh, where you're at right now. This is, um, this has been a, a huge honor to have you on my show. Thank you. I know we could keep talking. It feels like it's been 10 minutes. So I know. yeah, let's do this again <laughs> in a few months. Absolutely. Well, how, before I leave or before we leave, how can my, my listeners buy your book, which we didn't oh, talk about, you. but buy your book and follow you on social media and connect with you. Uh, I'm on social media. It's Miss Val Condos or something like that. Um, if you go to my website, officialmissbell.com you will see my musings i put up you will see the things that i write but if you go to the shop you'll get the book you can get the book and you can get the swag and um i'm very very proud that i developed this mask okay right. it's a miss Val mask that you can wear as a mask or a neck all scarf right. you can wear it as a headband and all the all the profits from my book from this, from all my swag goes to supporting young girls that have been rescued from sex trafficking. Wow. So please go to officialmissbell.com and buy loads and loads of these. They work really well. They stay up really well. And they're half the price of what others are on online. So officialmissbell.com. Thank you for asking. Appreciate that. <laughs> all right. Well, I encourage everyone to go buy those. Um, that's a, it's an incredible cause. And again, thank you for your, your energy. It's thank awesome. You. And, uh, and I can't wait to just keep connecting with you and, uh, and watching you grow. Let's do it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All righty.